All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. We are in the middle of referendum week. We're doing a bunch of special episodes in the run-up to the midterm election this November. We are going to be talking about some of our favorite midterm stories, some favorite polling stories, and this week is referendum week. Today, we are looking at a referendum from 2018, not that long ago, in North Dakota. A group of women who came to be known as the Badass Grandmas got together to help draft anti-corruption legislation in that state, an amendment to North Dakota's state constitution that, among other things, established a state ethics commission, guidelines for how lobbyists can interact with legislators, prohibiting lobbyists from giving gifts to legislators, providing a little more transparency about how dark money is used to influence elections. It was a major victory in that state for anti-corruption efforts and a sign of how referendums can really start to change the way our democracy functions, which is something we talked about on the last episode as well. And back with us is the guest who was on that last episode, Joshua Graham Lynn, CEO of the nonpartisan grassroots group Represent Us. They helped the grandmas in North Dakota draft and spread the word about the referendum. Represent Us is also the main partner on this pro-democracy podcast coalition project that I'm helping organize and a bunch of great shows are involved in. So, yes, this is another chance to talk about the power of referendums and other ways we can help fix our democracy here in the United States. Josh, welcome back. Thanks for doing back-to-back episodes with us. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jody. And with us, as always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. All right. It's in your hands. Tell us, how did you meet the grandmas? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So... The Badass Grandmas, as they're known, uh, are a group of women who got together in the state of North Dakota because what they saw was that uh, North Dakota government was not functioning for the people the way they wanted it to. And what was so unique about them is that it was Democrats, Republicans, and independents together. I think it was like two Democrats, an independent, a Republican. There were four of them to start. And it was just a group of women who were meeting for coffee to talk about what they could do about politics locally. And I think think that they got the name from one of their grandchildren who said, you are all just a bunch of badass grandmas and it's stuck. (laughs) What's incredible about their story. And I like to just say the end first, they were able to pass a law that completely overhauled North Dakota state government in terms of transparency, ethics, accountability, and making sure that the representatives were both transparent with the people, but also accountable to them. And so they started with an idea of what they wanted to get done, right? It's like, let's try to fix transparency in North Dakota. They had some of the worst transparency laws in the country. And to their credit, they reached out to represent us. And they said, you know, we've seen what you guys did in South Dakota, where we had passed a ballot initiative the cycle before. Uh, We're really interested in the whole idea of anti-corruption. We want to be leaders on this. What do we do? And our team said, oh, you've got to go do X, Y, and Z. You have to go find the right legal team and you're going to have to get a model legislation written up and it's a lot of work, but like, go do it and then get back to us. And of course they went and crushed it and came back. And so our team said, (laughs) oh, well, now that you've done that, you you should really have some local fundraising happening. Can you find a community 
Uh, it really should be cross-partisan. So continue to do what you're doing. Uh, I know it's a lot of work and a lot of people don't make it past this phase, but like, can you go try to do that? And of course they went and crushed it. And it got to the point where they had actually reached every strategic hurdle that needed to be met in order to get this thing on the ballot so that it could be voted on. Uh, the photos of them from election night, hugging and crying and celebrating their victory, knowing that they had made like a serious dent on the universe was just amazing. And that's why it's one of my favorite stories, because it is truly the story of a handful of regular people who just got inspired about the idea of saving democracy themselves, followed the playbook and won. I love this story. I love it because it just shows, one, you're never too old to do this work, right? <laughs> like, I think we often count out our, our fellow senior citizens and we shouldn't. Um, so I absolutely love that. I think it also shows that like, wherever you live in the world, it these things matter. I lived in North Dakota for four years and, uh, you know, it's hard. It's cold. <laughs> It can be it can be really tough politically. I think, you know, um, every space is, is pretty um, polarized right now. But the fact that they were able to come together and say, like, hey, doesn't matter our political affiliations, like right is right and wrong is wrong. And we want to make sure that people have transparency and we want to we want to know where the money's coming from. We want to know, like, who's giving and how much they're giving and where it's coming from, like follow the, the, the paper trail. Um, it's brilliant. It's great. Well, something else that I take from that is, first of all, the way that states as kind of laboratories of democracy can copy from one another. You see someone doing something right in a nearby state. Mm -hmm. um, you can figure out how to model it after that. But figuring it out, sometimes it you don't have to when you're inspired to do something, you don't have to have all of the answers right at the start. You don't know, need to know exactly how a bill becomes a law or how to put everything in place. You just need to reach out and ask for help. And then if you're willing to do the work, a bunch of small steps can get you toward big change. Um, and that's, you know, you just have to find the right partnership in order to make these things happen sometimes. There's a lot in here that I feel like cuts against a sort of understanding of the state of our politics right now. So mm. one is, I mean, you know, this is a bipartisan group in a deeply red state mm. in the Trump era, in the heart of, you know, what we feel like is a completely intractable, polarized moment. And, and you know, I don't want to paper over that fact that, that it, it it is a very polarized moment. But, you know, what what do you see in this story, Josh, or just in the when you talk to people, where do you see people able to bridge what for many people feels like a totally um, unbridgeable divide between Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. So I just saw a study. It was published recently. It was like a CBS YouGov poll that came out asking Americans, do you think that democracy under threat? And overwhelmingly, democracy is under threat. Overwhelmingly, I think it was 72% of people across party lines think that democracy is under serious threat. So first of all, we can agree on that. Here was the thing that was shocking to me. They then had the sense to ask, why do you feel this way? Like, why do you think it's so bad? And it's not, I was sort of surprised by the answer. The answer that most people gave was money in politics. 86% of Republicans said that the problem is money in politics. And 86% of Democrats said that the problem is money in politics. And now whether or not, whether or not that's technically the problem or you disagree, what's unbelievable is what a common understanding we have about the way we feel about how our government is working, right? Like we all agree and we're all frustrated about it. And so if you can find the space to recognize that someone you might disagree with on a whole bunch of other things agrees with you on this, you can take a first step together. And if that first step is fighting for a giant state law, well, then that's amazing. Mm -hmm. If the first step is recognizing that you're just neighbors and you disagree on politics, but at least you agree <laughs> that the system is broken, then that's also a good first step. <laughs> Well, it is a reminder that Citizens United, um, the 2010 Supreme Court case that opened the door for PACs and super PACs and more dark money in politics, was something that was deeply unpopular, even at the time that it was handed down. And those numbers that you just cited, Josh, 86 percent, that's enough for a constitutional amendment. Now, building political consensus on a constitutional amendment is difficult, but finding 86% of Americans who agree on anything is uh, is pretty impressive. And that's the seeds for some sort of change. It certainly is. I guess what I would say about that is there's lots of issues that we all agree on, right? And I'm not even going to enumerate them, but we've all seen the studies on issues that we think of as really contentious. But when you get down to it, 
most people agree. And the problem is that we don't have representation in our government. The government is not accountable to the people. So there's this shocking study from Princeton in 2014. The big takeaway is that the preferences of the average American, and this is a direct quote, appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. And what they found Hmm. was that if 30%, if 0% of Americans agree on something, so like zero people think this is a good idea, there's a 30% (laughs) chance Congress will pass a law based on that idea. And if 100% of people agree on it, there's a 30% chance that Congress will pass a law based on it. (laughs) Wow. And that's just for average Americans. So that feeling that we have, that if we're just an average American, we don't actually have agency, they proved that it's really true. Mm. Wow. I can't imagine why people think democracy is broken. I know. <laughs> I know. To go back yeah. to the badass grandmas, the reason I brought this all up is like, you would think that's enough people to do a constitutional amendment. Mm. But what it actually is enough people to do is go win state by state, get the ballot initiative on the ballot, work with your legislature if you don't have the initiative process and win these laws in states because that's where we can win now. So in 2018, yeah. they were one of 23 states that passed pro-democracy laws. Like that's a lot of things happening and we forget about that. Yeah. Um, you know, but to something you said with the, with the, with the grandmas, I mean, you said, you know, uh, get together with someone and do something. And maybe the first thing you do is pass a big initiative like the one that we're discussing here. But actually, you know, it's interesting. This, In many ways, this wasn't the first thing that this group did. This was a culmination of at least the two leaders here, you know, one Republican, one Democrat. These were women who had worked with each other going back into the 70s. And they knew each other. They'd worked on smaller stuff together. They sort of bonded over the Equal Rights mm-hmm. Amendment, advocacy around that. And I mean, to me, the lesson there is like, I think all of us in, in whatever way have said that uh, some a variation of the word sort of first step. But it's just take one step, then take another step and build and build and build and build relationships. And then, you know, you never know where those are going to those are going to lead. So in some ways, this is like a remarkable first effort. But in the other other ways, it's a real proof that like you just cultivate those relationships with one another and you get to know people. And then maybe that's where you can bridge the partisan divide and all those things. Because you've known, you know, that's another human being you, who you've known for 20 years and you yeah. may disagree on stuff, but you also have something. You find that one thing that you do agree upon and you work from there. I love that. And, and the one other thing I'll just add to that is like. You know, this is a little soapboxy here, but like you don't get to build those relationships unless you're like actually in a room with someone, right? Like you don't build those on the internet. You don't build those. And, yeah. You know, and so yeah. like that's where I just, and I mean, this is, you know, a real evolution for me since the days of hosting the 538 podcast, you know, but it's like you get in a room with someone at the very local level. That's where you meet someone who then maybe 30 years down the line, you're going to be doing a statewide referendum with, but like you have to get out of your house, off the internet, into an actual room and give yourself the opportunity to meet someone who you might forge a relationship and and bridge a divide with. Yeah. I also think it's interesting that that 86% think that big money is is a problem because most people are just trying to, you know, save up or or get by or generate wealth in any way that they can. And money becomes a crucial solidifying issue. I think when people think about access to power, who is left out of that or who's included in that, Mm -hmm. most of us are left out of those, those, those tight knit circles of billionaires that are plotting and, and, and all of that. And so it does make sense that people can come together around these issues because, you know, you're talking about 99.9% of the population in that sense. I would also say like one more takeaway from these grannies is two women that got together working for the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s are two people who can tell you about political disappointment and running into dead ends. Mm. It seemed like the Equal Rights Amendment was going to be part of the Constitution. They had all but a few states, and then they hit a backlash force that um, ultimately repealed some passage and um, ended up with the Equal Rights Amendment not becoming part of the Constitution after a hundred years of effort to get it to be part of it. And they didn't use that as an excuse to drop out of politics or to stop trying and or to turn on each other right yeah yeah Yeah. which you could see happening yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. all right well 
It was nice to spend some time with the grandmas. Um, <laughs> and and again, we will reiterate that there are things you can do right now, and we're proud to be part of this coalition that's that's, that's working and partnering with uh, Represent Us. So I'll say the website again, represent.us slash pod, represent.us slash pod. Uh, Joshua Gramlin, CEO of Represent Us. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, back to back to work. I know you have a big sprint for the next few weeks uh, we before the election. Do. Thanks so All much right. for having me. Appreciate it. All right. And Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure.